I'd like to welcome everyone again to this uh, winter night uh, meeting that we have through Zoom. And we had, uh, well, last time I was on, I uh, was in the book of Esther, and I hope you've read it again. But uh, we're going to start with the sixth chapter of Esther this time. But you, you recall in the fifth chapter, uh, Mordecai had uh, instructed Esther to uh, intervene on behalf of the Jews because of what Haman, Haman had done. And uh, of course, she was maybe a little apprehensive, but because she had not been invited to the throne room for over a month, and uh, anybody to enter the throne room, room without invitation, subject to death, unless the king uh, raised his golden orb. Well, in chapter 5, she did enter the throne room uninvited, and King uh, Ahasuerus uh, raised the golden orb. So she was able to make her appeal. He had said, you know, whatever it is you want, I, up to the half of my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And uh, what she did was invited him and Haman to a banquet the uh, following night, following day. So here we uh, have uh, chapter six, and there's some warnings that were given to Haman, because, but you know, people like that usually don't listen to warnings. They, uh, they value their opinion of themselves and the exclusion of what is reasonable. So that, uh, that morning, the next day, as uh, Haman left home, he uh, left early in the morning. You know, he was he wanted to hurry up and get to the palace, and but he didn't know that this was to be his last day. So, in speaking to the house of Israel, uh, Lord uh, said said them in, in Ezekiel thirty three eleven we have what uh, was said there say to them as I live says the Lord God I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live turn turn from your evil ways for why should you die O house of Israel and in second Peter three nine we read there the Lord is long suffering towards us not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. So Haman was being given warning. So, you know, the uh, Lord was not even willing that even Haman should perish. But we have to keep in mind that uh, Haman, by his, his own volition and action, he condemned himself. And once someone has a mind to do that, he is a will to to follow his own path. God can't do anything about that. Jesus said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gather, gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. That's found in Matthew the 23rd chapter verse 37. <clears throat> so God's desire for sinners is not that they should die, but they that they turn from their sins and be saved. <clears throat> There's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Luke 15, chapter verses 7 and 10. But the Lord is not going to force people turn from their sins and trust the son as we just read I wanted to but you were not willing and Haman was not willing as much as we detest Haman and his uh, foul deeds we must keep in mind that God loves sinners and wants them to be saved and has done everything possible to make that happen. 
God is long suffering and allows the various trials, tribulations, and good influences as well uh, to bear upon the people's hearts as he seeks to turn them from their evil ways. So we're going to see some of these influences that uh, work in the events of this chapter. <clears throat> in the first five verses of chapter six, uh, once again, we see the providence of God at work in the life of King Ahasuerus. God was working at his purposes through the king, although the king was unaware of his purposes. In the sixth chapter, we find evidences of God's providence. First part, there's the uh, matter of the king's insomnia. Solomon stated the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. Ecclesiastes 5th chapter verse 12. <clears throat> so no doubt the head of a state that has a, there's a lot to think about. And those thoughts and worries may cause insomnia. But why this night? I mean, he had all this problem before. Why not the previous night or the next night? Surely he'd still have problems the next night. So why this night? Well, that's God's providence. So some or all of these worries that you know a king has may have played a part in the king's insomnia, but remember the saying of the psalmist, he will not allow your foot to be moved. <clears throat> he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. It's the 121st Psalm, verses 3 and 4. In working out the salvation of the Jews, God wanted the king to stay awake and then divert his mind with some reading from the Chronicles. And that was the king's source of relaxation uh, to have someone read to them but also part of God's providence is the servant's choice of books I'm sure he had a lot of books to choose from but he chose this book so uh, the Hazarus directed one of his servants to bring that book the book of the Chronicles to be read to him as a, man, as a way of relaxation <clears throat> But the servant read uh, from the very book in that very entry that recorded Mordecai's service to the king five years before. <clears throat> to say again, why that book and why that entry? It'd be God's providence at work. And the king's delay in, in record, uh, rewarding Mordecai is a key factor in the unraveling of events. Or had Mordecai been honored five years before when the, you know, the, uh, when he saved the king's life, the events of this critical day would not have occurred. Uh, rewards and punishments were basic to the Persian system of maintaining loyalty. And it was unusual for meritorious service to go unrewarded. So why was Mordecai's good deed written down but forgotten? Well, we we don't know again, but uh, it could be God's providence. But we do know that God used this to play to control the event that was shortly to occur, namely the honoring of Mordecai for the as yet unrecognized service rendered to the king so many years ago. It was not the first time uh, that uh, something like this happened. You recall after befriending Pharaoh's butler, Joseph believed that he would, it would lead to his being released from prison. 
but he had to wait two more years until it was time, uh, till the time God had chosen uh, for him to become second to Pharaoh in Egypt. God had a specific day selected for the Jews to leave Egypt. Uh, Exodus 12 and 40 and 42. And even the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem occurred when the fullness of the time had come. Galatians 4, verse 4. We need to remember, remember that God's delays are not God's denials. You know, we sometimes get impatient and wonder why the wicked are prospering while the righteous are suffering. But God is uh, never in a hurry. You know, you, you need to recall the 37th Psalm or go back and read that one. So he is long suffering towards the wicked because he wants them to repent. And he is patient with his people because he wants them to receive the right reward at the right time for the right purpose. If Mordecai was ever puzzled, we don't know that he was, uh, because the king promoted Haman but, not, but ignored him, well, he would soon find out that God was always in control. The timely arrival of Haman after 6 chapter verse 4, uh, and that was also providential. And it's possible that Haman had been up all night enjoying the supervision of the construction of the gallows in which he planned to hang Mordecai. It was very early in the morning, but Haman wanted to see the king as soon as possible and get permission for the execution. As the pro proverb writer says, his, sweet, uh, his feet were swift in running to evil. Proverbs 6, chapter verse 18. <clears throat> From Haman's point of view, the earlier the hanging, the better. Mordecai's body would be on exhibition all day. And this would delight Haman and it would put fear, put fear in the hearts of the Jews of the city. And after executing Mordecai, Haman could be certain that everybody would obey the king's command and bow down to him. The timing of Haman's arrival is providential as well, since otherwise the king would have consulted with other advisors and Haman would have been left out of the celebration for Mordecai. God wanted Haman to spend the day honoring Mordecai and not gloating over Mordecai's corpse on the gallows. <clears throat> it should have been a warning to Haman, but he neither recognized nor heeded this warning. <clears throat> Although we see these evidences of the providence of God uh, when we read about them, prospectively, we can only acknowledge that God's providence is constantly at work. <clears throat> As the 33rd Psalm verses 10 through 11 says, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stand forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. And in the 21st, uh, or Proverbs 21 verse 30, it says there, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. <clears throat> and the verse that we're familiar with, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. So this uh, was be a, to be a morning of decision. Uh, we read about this in the middle part of chapter 6 of Esther. So when the king was contemplating uh, what should be done to honor Mordecai, Haman stood in the court. <clears throat> the king had him escorted inside. Now this uh, new honor, as uh, Haman viewed it, it only increased his pride and his false confidence. <clears throat> he thought he was in control of events. 
and that Mordecai's doom was sealed. Haman's intent was to suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged. But the first thing that uh, happened was the king asked for Haman's advice on, on what honor to bestow upon, quote unquote, the man whom the king liked to honor. Now, the king did not, uh, when he asked the question, he did not identify the man whom the king liked to honor. He just asked the question. And Haman, being Haman, he concluded that the king must be speaking about him. After all, what other man in the empire deserved such an honor from the king? Or so he thought. <clears throat> After the way Mordecai had insulted him, Haman would now get double revenge. First, Mordecai would see Haman honored by the king, and then Mordecai would be hanged on the gallows. Then Haman would climax the day by feasting merrily. He, he would uh, feast with the king and queen. But God's providence, however, hit, uh, mitigated against such an outcome. Before the day would end, the situation would be completely reversed. Haman would be forced to honor Mordecai before all the people of the city. Esther's feast would turn out to be an expose of the traitor. And Haman, not Mordecai, would end up on the gallows. As is written in Proverbs 11, chapter verse 8, <clears throat> the righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. Also in Proverbs 18, chapter verse 12, before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty. And before honor is humility. The first half of that verse describes Haman. And the last half describes Mordecai. Proverbs 29, chapter verse 23 gives the same, uh, essentially the same message. A man's pride shall bring him low, but the humble spirit shall retain honor. And we have to ask, you know, what's half characterizes us, but half characterizes you. So thinking that the king was de describing the honor, the honors he himself would receive, Haman asked for the very best. A man to be honored should be dressed in the king's own apparel. He should ride on the king's horse with a royal crest on his head. And one of the noble princes should lead the horse to the city and command the people to honor him. So it was a morning of uh, the, a decision. The king had decided to reward Mordecai. And Haman had decided what the reward should be. So what were the results of this morning of decision? Well, in this uh, sixth chapter, verses 11 to 14, it was a... Uh, for Haman, it was a day of disgrace. So when he found out who the man was, <clears throat> it didn't really matter what his inward, uh, inward reaction was. He was in the king's presence, so he had to bow to the king's commandment, and uh, he obeyed. First, he had to go out to the king's gate, get Mordecai, bring him into the palace, then he had to dress Mordecai in the king's robes. After putting Mordecai on the king's horse, Haman had to lead the horse throughout the city and proclaim, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Verse 9. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate doing what he customarily did. The honor seemingly did not inflate his ego. So the contrast between Haman and, and Mordecai is uh, glaring. Haman's reaction was quite different, for he was uh, humiliated. He hurried to his home. He was in mourning. He covered his head. And Mordecai also mourned when the edict, edict came out. But his mourning was not for himself. It was for his people. 
Now, Haman was a well-known man in the kingdom. He was a man of reputation, but only because the king had made it so. He was not a man of character. His reputation depended on his office, his wealth, and his authority, all of which could easily be taken from him, and indeed, it was. In the 29th chapter of Proverbs, verse 23, the writer wrote, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. At uh, Haman's home, his wife and counselors made an interesting statement. Now, they said in verse 13, If Mordecai, for whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Now, this was a God warning Haman. <clears throat> but the proud minister uh, would not heed the warning. Had he repented and asked for mercy, he could have saved his own life and the lives of his ten sons. But he wouldn't do it. While Haman was discussing his misfortunes with his wife and advisors, King's eunuchs arrived at the door to escort Haman to the Queen's banquet. He had planned to go merrily with King to the banquet, with Mordecai safely out of the way, but now everything had changed. What remained was the mysterious petition that Queen Esther would reveal at the banquet. So off Haman went to his last meal. <clears throat> In chapter 7, everything is revealed. Haman's mask comes off. When the king and Haman arrived at the banquet uh, Esther had prepared, there was no indication that the king or Haman knew that Esther was a Jewess. This was the seventh banquet recorded in the book of Esther. Had Haman known the nationality of the queen, he may not have been so joyful. God had warned Haman uh, through circumstances, through his advisors, and through his wife, but he would not heed the warning. In Proverbs, the uh, 16th proverb, chapter 16, verse 5, <clears throat> everyone proud and hard is, is an abomination to the Lord. <clears throat> Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. God's long suffering led Haman into thinking he was safe. In Ecclesiastes, the eighth chapter, verse 11, we read, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. <clears throat> God's long suffering today is an opportunity for people to repent, as was said by Peter in 2 Peter 3, 9, which we read previously. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, <clears throat> but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all, all should come to repentance. But our sinful world thinks it means God will not judge sinners at all. Haman was like so many today. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse three. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we're going to learn here the uh, uh, queen's request uh, at this banquet. Ahasuerus again said to Esther, what is your petition? <clears throat> and she was uh, very diplomatic in her reply. She acknowledged that she depended on the favor of the king and that her desire was to please the king. She focused her petition on the fact that her life was threatened as well as the lives of her people. Furthermore, the enemy that threatened such destruction could never compensate the king for such potential loss. 
Who is he, the king asked. Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? She replied, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. At a considerable risk to herself, or so she had good reason to believe, Queen Esther, Esther interceded for a people not certain ahead of time exactly how the king would respond. As the sage of old said, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. The Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. Proverbs 16, chapter verses 3 and 4. Well, <clears throat> you can guess what happened. So at that moment, uh, you know, perhaps it was that Ahasuerus really realized that he had been deceived by his uh, favorite officer, Haman, <clears throat> who had hatched this plot, the purpose of which was to kill all the Jews as a personal vendetta against Mordecai. Now, knowing that Esther was a Jewish, he knew that Haman would also destroy her along with Mordecai and all the other Jews. Now we can uh, better understand why God directed Esther to delay her pleas. He wanted to give a hazardous opportunity to, to learn what Mordecai had done, that Mordecai was a Jew, and that he deserved to be honored. So if a Jew had saved the king's life, why should the king exterminate the Jews? <clears throat> In Esther, the seventh chapter, verse seven, we read, and the king in his wrath arose from the banquet of wine and went to the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. <clears throat> now, we cannot uh, uh, lightly dismiss the king's part in all this. He was a man with a short temper. <clears throat> especially if a few drinks. But on this occasion, his, his anger must have been volcanic. He blithely misjudged the character of Haman. He had made a fool of himself by promoting Haman and by giving him so much influence. King had also erred in approving the decree without first weighing all the facts. He did the very thing addressed in Proverbs 18, chapter verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. As a result, he had endangered the lives of two very special Jews, Mordecai, who had saved his life, and Esther, his beloved wife. <clears throat> no doubt the uh, king walked to uh, back and forth in the garden, doing his best to control the anger that uh, had welled up in him. In Proverbs 16th 16, 16, uh, chapter, verse 14, we read, as messengers of death is the king's wrath. And the king's wrath is like a, a roaring of, of a lion. Six, uh, 19th chapter, verse 12 of Proverbs. Haman had every reason to be afraid. He knew the king was about to pass a sentence from which there would be no escape. But for Haman, there was one remote possibility, uh, the mercy of the queen. Perhaps he could arouse uh, her pity and get her to intercede for him. He was a, an arrogant bully who, in the face of disaster, became a whining coward. It was easy to strut about when the authority of the king had been behind him. But now that the anger of the king was against him, Haman's true character was revealed. <clears throat> Haman had been furious because a Jewish man would not bow down to him. And now Haman was prostrate before a Jewish woman begging for his life. When the king entered the room and saw the scene, 
he accused Haman of trying to molest the queen. Haman's face was covered, and one of the eunuchs suggested to the king that Haman should be hanged on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. So, uh, further in chapter 7 of Esther, we, we're going to see Esther, I mean, the Haman's reward for his actions. Proverbs 11, chapter verse 8 reads, The righteous is delivered from trouble, and it comes to the wicked instead. The conspicuous gallows that Haman had constructed for Mordecai was convenient for the execution of Haman. Therefore, the king used it. Apparently, Haman had let it be known in the palace that he planned to hang Mordecai on this gallows. For the king's servants that informed the king about the gallows, he knew the purpose of the gallows. In his pride, Haman had boasted just a little too much. <clears throat> and his words came back not only to haunt him, but also to slay him. We read in Galatians the sixth chapter, verse seven, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will uh, also reap. Now this is uh, no, was no less true for Haman than for us. He sowed anger against Mordecai, and he reaped anger from the king. Haman wanted to kill Mordecai and the Jews, and the king killed Haman. As Eliphaz the Temanite said, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Fourth chapter of Job, verse 8. And as the uh, sage said in Proverbs, the, 20, the 22nd uh, chapter, verse 8, he who sows iniquity will reap sorrow, and the rod of his anger <clears throat> will fall. <clears throat> this unchanging principle of sowing and reaping is illustrated throughout the Bible and it applies to both believers and unbelievers Jacob killed an animal and lied to his father pretending to be Esau and years later Jacob's sons killed an animal and lied to him pretending that Joseph was dead. Pharaoh gave orders to drown the Jewish baby boys, and one day his army was drowned in the Red Sea. David secretly took Uriah's wife and committed adultery, and David's own son Absalom took his father's concubines and openly committed adultery with him. Furthermore, David's daughter Tamar was raped by her half-brother Amnon. David killed Bathsheba's husband, and three of David's own sons were slain, Absalom, Amnon, and Adonijah. Saul of Tarsus encouraged the stoning of Stephen, and when he became Paul the, the missionary, the apostle, he was stoned at Lystra. But keep in mind that this uh, law of sowing and reaping also applies to doing what is good and right. If we sow to the flesh, we reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we reap everlasting life. Galatians 6, chapter verse 8. No good deed done for the glory of Jesus Christ will ever be forgotten before God. No loving word spoken in the name of Jesus will ever be wasted. If we do not see the harvest in this life, we will see it when we stand before the Lord. Even a cup of cold water given in the name of Christ will have its reward. Haman was hanged on his own gallows. All his wealth and position could not rescue him from death. As the psalmist wrote, those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches None of them can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, 
and the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. <clears throat> That's in the 49th Psalm. You can read the whole Psalm. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 18 and 19, Paul tells us our redemption was not by corruptible things, by the, but by the precious blood of Christ. <clears throat> In the 10th verse of uh, Esther, uh, chapter 7, we read that the uh, king's wrath subsided. But though the, the adversary was out of the way, Haman, the problem was not completely solved, for the king's decree was still in effect and could not be changed. It was now the third month, uh, we find that in Esther, Esther chapter 8, verse 9. <clears throat> so there's still nine months to go for the fateful day when the Jews could legally be slain. So in chapter 8, we see the Jews uh, go from being uh, victim uh, to victors. And it's a chapter of good news of a new law. Haman was dead but his edict was still very much alive. Long after wicked people are gone, the consequences of their evil words and deeds live on. Even today, innocent people are suffering because of wicked people who lie in their graves. Unless something intervened within nine months, the Persians would attack the Jews and wipe them off the face of the earth. <clears throat> The Lord had brought Esther and Mordecai to the kingdom, quote unquote, for such a time as this. And they were prepared to act. In the first part of uh, Esther 8, or in, in, in Esther chapter 8, we see where Mordecai was uh, promoted. The king gave Haman's estate to, to Esther. And Esther, uh, Ahasuerus knew that both Esther and Mordecai were Jews. When Haman was disposed, the king took back his royal signet ring. That's the insignia of the authority of the throne. And he gave the ring to Mordecai, making him something, uh, we probably call it a prime minister, prime minister or something like that. <clears throat> so with a Jewish queen and a Jewish prime minister in the palace, uh, the Jews in the empire were in a better political position than ever before. Esther put the management of Haman's vast estate into the hands of Mordecai, who had first opposed Haman and refused to bow down. Were it not for Mordecai's courage and his encouragement of Esther, Haman would still be in control. <clears throat> in the 37th Psalm, verses 34-36, uh, it reads there, Wait on the Lord and keep his way. And he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. And I've seen the wicked in great power in spreading himself like a native green tree. Yet he passed away, and behold, he was no more. The king made sure that Mordecai had a uniform uh, described in 15 verses, chapter 8, worthy of his office. No longer did Mordecai wear old barred robes, but new robes were prepared especially for him. The official royal colors were blue and white, and the golden crown, which is probably a, a large turban, uh, along with a robe of white and purple, identified uh, Mordecai as an important man of authority. So what was uh, Esther's petition in, in this case had been the third time she made a, a petition. Uh, now she had wealth, prestige, and personal security, but that could not satisfy Esther as long as her people were still in danger. Esther could not do everything, but what she could do, she did. 
she approached the throne of the king, and again he held out the royal scepter. She asked him to reverse the edict that Haman had designed. <clears throat> and that edict, of course, had the royal signet, the sign on it. It was her interceding at the throne that saved the people of Israel from slaughter. She was asking nothing for herself except that the king save her people and deliver her from the heavy burden on her heart. <clears throat> Concern and vesture for her people is not like that of her other worthies. When Israel sinned, Moses met God on the mountain and intercede, interceded for them. It's in the 32nd chapter of Exodus. He was even willing for God to blot him out of the book of life if that was what it took to rescue the nation. <clears throat> of course, that was not possible. And the Apostle Paul said he was willing to be a curse from Christ if it would help save unbelieving Israel. Romans 5, chapter verse 1 through 6. Free, but again, you couldn't do that. On Mount Carmel, Elijah prayed for disobedient Israel, 1 Kings chapter 18. And in the palace, Nehemiah prayed for the Jews in Jerusalem, 1 chapter of Nehemiah. Like Nehemiah, Ezra wept and prayed and asked God to help his sinful people, 9 chapter of Ezra. And Daniel humbled himself and fasted and prayed that he might understand what God's plan was for Israel. Now, chapter of Daniel. <clears throat> in Isaiah, the 67th chapter, verse 67, we read, I have set a watchman on your walls, O Jerusalem, who shall never hold their peace day or night. You will make mention of the Lord. Do not keep silent and give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth in the earth. Esther's example is no less an encouragement to us than uh, these worthies we just uh, mentioned. <clears throat> so what was the king's proclamation? We find that in chapter 8 also, let it part. See, the problem that Esther and Mordecai faced was that the king, simply by executive fiat, could not cancel the first edict since the laws of the Medes and Persians were unalterable. The king could not legally revoke his, the, the first edict, but he could issue a new decree that would favor the Jews. A new decree written by Mordecai in the name of the king permitted the Jews to gather and protect their lives by force. Remember, Mordecai had now the signet ring. <clears throat> and the Jews killed only those who sought their harm. They killed only the men in uh, chapter 9, verse 6, 12, and 15. They did not lay hands on the plunder, verse 10 and 15 to 16. They did kill the ten sons of Haman. That's in the 7th through 10th verse of chapter 9. They killed 800 men in the city of uh, Shushan, or Susa, whichever you prefer. And they, uh, they, that sort of proved that uh, many Persians in the city still wished to attack the Jews. The total number of the slain was 75,000, verse 16. Uh, still, the Jews laid no hands on the plunder. Um, Mordecai wrote a liberating new edict in which the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, as he said, it was, it was said. <clears throat> However, the message uh, once written, written, had to get out to the people. The king's scribes translated this uh, new message into the language of all 127 provinces, including the language and script of the Jews. Copies of the decree were carried by couriers who rode on royal horses, went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command. That's in the 14th verse of chapter 8. It was an urgent message of salvation. Today we have a, another urgent message of salvation. 
written in every language, that is, the gospel of Christ. We are the couriers who ride on royal horses, hastened and pressed on by the King Eternal, that's Jesus Christ. Ever since the fall of Adam, the quote unquote, the law of sin and death has been in force in this world, Romans 8, chapter 2, 5, and chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. And God has not and will not rescind that law. <clears throat> The wages of sin is still death, Romans 6.23. God fulfilled the law of sin and death when he gave his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God put another law into effect. The law of the spirit and life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.2. <clears throat> Again, what we mentioned before, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, his promise, as some count slackness, <clears throat> but his long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, chapter 8 begins with Queen Esther in tears, but it ends with the Jews rejoicing and feasting. This is the uh, eighth feast mentioned in the book of Esther. The Jews had been mourning and fasting, but now they were ecstatic with joy, even though the month of Adar was sometime in the future. Yet they rejoiced. Yeah, why was that? The thing that made the difference was not the writing of the decree or even this distribution of various provinces. The thing that made the difference was the fact that the Jews believed the decree. They had hope, joy, and peace because they believed what Mordecai uh, said. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, chapter verse, 30, verse 13. So we've got the gospel that gives us hope, joy, and peace if we believe it. In the Esther chapters 9 and 10, uh, God's counsel of the Jews uh, through the prophet Jeremiah was to seek the peace of the city that I have caused you to be carried away captive. Jeremiah 29 verse 7. And they obeyed it for the most part. <clears throat> Here it was not the Jews who had declared war on the Gentiles, but the Gentiles who had declared war on the Jews. <clears throat> The twelfth month, the month of Adar, the thirteenth day finally arrived. The enemies of the Jews still hoped to overpower them, but the opposite occurred. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. First verse of chapter 9. Note that the Jews were given nine months to prepare for this day. <clears throat> the Jewish men were organized and armed, ready to meet any enemy who would attack them and their families and try to take their possessions. But the Lord had given them a greater weapon than their sword because, quote unquote, the fear of them fell upon all the people. In verse uh, 17 of chapter 8 and 2 of chapter 9. In chapter 3, I mean, verse 3 of chapter 9, we read even all the officials of the provinces, satraps, governors, and all those doing the king's work kept the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. This was the same fear that went before Israel as they entered the promised land. Jacob and the Israelites benefited from the same fear as he traveled from Shechem to Bethel. In Deuteronomy 2nd chapter verse 25 we read, or excuse me, the Genesis 35th chapter verse 5, we read, and they journeyed, and the fear of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now in Deuteronomy, the uh, second chapter, verse 25, and it's also in chapter 11, 25. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the old heaven, who shall hear the report of you 
and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. Rahab told the two Jewish spies that the fear of Israel, Israel had paralyzed the nations in Canaan. Uh, Joshua, second chapter, verse 8 and 11, and also in chapter 5 and, and chapter 9. And that fear helped give Israel the victory. The writers of uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 18 said, There is no fear of God before their eyes. There should be, but sadly there is not. Like Pharaoh of old, people say, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Now, the people say the same thing today, except they substitute sin for Israel. <clears throat> but have they seen anything in the people of God that would make them want to fear the Lord? Let's uh, suppose an unbeliever or at least an uninformed person comes into our midst. Is he or she convinced by all in, in word or deed or both of the truth of the gospel so that he or she will, in a sense, fall on their face and worship God and report that God is truly among us? 1 Corinthians 14, chapter verse 25. God protects those who fear him and believe his promises. Because the Jews believed Mordecai's decree, they had new courage and were not afraid of the enemy. And their courage put fear in the hearts of the enemy. Uh, look at the Philippians, the uh, first chapter, verse 28. You know, talk about not being terrified by adversaries. Before, before King Jehoshaphat went to the battle, God's message to him was, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his pro uh, prophets and you shall prosper. Uh, that's in Second Chronicles 20, chapter 20. And this is still wise counsel. <clears throat> but there was another aspect of this fear that helped give the Jews their victory. And that was the people's fear of Mordecai, third verse of chapter 9. The princes, deputies, governors, and officers of the king throughout the empire were in such awe of Mordecai that they even helped the Jews defend themselves against the Persians. God had given Mordecai his high position and great reputation, and Mordecai used his authority to do the will of God. The Persians who attacked the Jews were in sympathy with Haman and the Amalekites, and this made them enemies of God. In slaying those who attacked them, the Jews were by proxy agents of King Saul, and they were fulfilling what Saul had failed to do. In Esther, the ninth chapter, verses 5 through 15, we're given the report of Shushan. And in verses 16 and 17, additional news was given about what happened to the other parts of the empire. During two days of conflict, the Jews killed 800 of their enemies in Susa, Shushan. And also the 10 sons of Haman were slain. The bodies of the 10 sons were hanged on Haman's gallows as a warning to the enemy. On the feast of Purim, the synagogue leader, uh, reader reads those ten names all in one breath because the sons of Haman all died together. The Jews in other parts of the empire killed 75,000 in one day. <clears throat> it was stated three times that the Jews did not take any of the spoil. It was in taking spoil from the enemy that King Saul lost his kingdom, 1 Samuel 15, chapter verses 20, 12 and following. And the Jews did not repeat his mistake. They were not after wealth. They wanted only to protect themselves and vindicate their right to live safely in the empire. And remember, the Jews killed only those who first attacked them. The Jews were not the aggressors. In the latter part of uh, chapter 9, <clears throat> the Jews established the Feast of Purim. 
and East Texas, we might say Purim, but it's Purim. Uh, to remind their children year after year that God had saved Israel from destruction. It is still, it's still observed today among the Jews. The Jews in the provinces finished their fighting on the 13th day of Adar, and they spent the next day celebrating. But since the Jews in, in Shushan were still defending themselves on the 14th day, they did not get to celebrate until the 15th. In the beginning, the Jews were united in their victory, but divided in their celebration. It all depended on where you lived, in the, uh, whether you lived in the city or the country. Mordecai, however, later issued a letter that instructed all the Jews to celebrate on both the 14th and 15th days of the month. And that's in the 20 and 22nd verses of chapter 9. Today, you know, they still uh, celebrate the uh, day or the feast of Purim. The Jews begin their celebration with a fast on the 13th day of the month, uh, verse 31, and they commemorate the date on which Haman's evil decree was issued, verse 12 of the chapter 3. They go to the synagogue and hear the book of Esther publicly read. And whenever the name is, of Haman is mentioned, they cry out uh, something like, may he be accursed or may his name perish. And children bring a special Purim rattle called uh, Gregar. They have no idea what that is. And they use it to make a noise every time they hear uh, Haman's name read. On the morning of the 14th day of the month, the Jews again go to the synagogue where the Esther story is read again. And the congregation engages in prayer. The story about Moses and the Amorites, Exodus 17, chapter verses 8 through 16, is also read. Then the celebrants go home to a festive holiday meal with gifts and special foods, and the celebration continues on the next day. They also send gifts and food to the poor and needy so that everybody can rejoice together. The name Purim is the plural of the Babylonian word Pur, which means lot. It originates from casting lots for Haman to determine the day when the Jews would be destroyed. You find that in third chapter of Esther, verse 7, and also in chapter 9. Even though there uh, was no divine instruction or sanction given to this new feast, the, the Jews determined that it would be celebrated from generation to generation. <clears throat> and there is an emphasis on teaching the children the meaning of Purim so that the message of the feast would not be lost in future generations. Not only did Mordecai send a letter of instruction to the Jews and the empire, but Esther the queen also joined Mordecai in sending a second letter. Perhaps some of the Jews in the provinces did not want to change from their original day of celebration. And it was necessary for both, both Esther and Mordecai to issue this second letter to keep peace in the nation. The second letter is described as words of peace and truth, verse 30, which suggests there was, uh, or at least could have been some division among the Jewish people that needed to be healed. Not only did Esther and Mordecai send letters, but they also had the matter written in a book that Mordecai used as his personal record. The story of the victory, victory of the Jews over their enemies was celebrated at an annual feast recorded in two official letters, written in a journal, and ultimately included in the Old Testament scripture. <clears throat> in chapter 10, a very short chapter, but it uh, is really an exaltation of Mordecai. He used his office to serve the king and help the Jews. And sometimes when people are elevated to high office, they forget their roots and ignore the needs of the common people. Mordecai was not that kind of man. Even though his uh, political deeds are recorded in the official annals of the empire, what he did for his people 
has been recorded by the Lord and will be rewarded. But the important message of this uh, chapter is that God continued to use Mordecai to help the Jewish people. The Jews were aliens in a foreign land and subject to all kinds of harassment and abuse. Mordecai saw to it, saw to it that they were treated with fairness. And the last words of the book are seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. So that is uh, ends my comments on Esther. It's a very good book to study from time to time and renew its lessons in your mind. But before we end tonight, I want to uh, have a short word of prayer if you'd bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this uh, lesson that we've been privileged to hear. We're grateful for all that there is recorded for posterity in the Holy Writ. And we pray as diligent students of Thy Word, we will learn those eternal truths that will guide us in this life and on to the life to come. Be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. May they have peace. May they have comfort and good health. And may we all meet again this coming Sunday in order to engage in worship to Thee. We thank Thee for Jesus and for the example that He left us. It's in His name we pray. Amen.